The temperature just turned 28 The sun's gone down, won't come up till the next day It's like only having cold water spray When there's caked on butter on your dirty dinner plates Wish you had hydronic, don't you think? It's like rain but it's actually warm It's a cozy van During the next storm It's some good advice You should probably take There's a link down below With figures Uh, is this you? And wish you had Maybe electronic. Why, do you like it? Don't you mm. think? I like the original better Whatever. What is up, my dudes and dudettes? Behind that camera is Colleen, and I am Todd. And if you are new to this channel, we make these wildly explanatory YouTube videos of us converting this 2022 Sprinter cargo van that you see behind me here. Today, we're gonna be scooting around on this little baby under the van a lot because we are installing our hydronic system. What is a hydronic system? Other than sounding like it was illegal to install in your closet in California prior to the year 2016, <laughs> oh, sorry, that's hydroponics. Just a little joke for those of you who dance with the devil's lettuce. <laughs> I'm sorry, Colleen really needs to proofread some of this stuff. Anyways, the hydronic system is responsible for all our hot water needs in the van, a necessary luxury in our build. There's a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and dive right into it. In order to mount our 20 liter ISO temp, we need to do a little bit of body work by removing this structural brace. I started by drilling a bunch of little holes and connecting those dots with the Dremel and a cutoff wheel. The sparks look straight bussin, but it wasn't the most efficient process. Luckily for us, we remembered we have an air saw. Now equipped with this beast, we went to town cutting the metal with the speed of a lumberjack on Red Bull, yet the dexterity of a master bonsai gardener sculpting ancient junipers on the rocky crests of Mount Fuji. Okay, okay. A little over the top, I know, but dang, I love this tool. It is probably at this point where you are at home thinking to yourself, Todd, what the heck are you doing cutting structural support members from the frame of your van? And while I don't blame you and you should not do this yourself, I will explain my rationale. This particular support member that I just removed is the center one on the driver's side. There is a factory code from Mercedes called H13, which adds an auxiliary heater to that bay. With that heater, this particular support member is not there. That is why I feel that this can be removed without any serious impact to the van. Now, I will say I did get a little bit ahead of myself, and if I were to do this again, I would probably only cut an arc for the diameter of the cylindrical body of the water heater instead of removing the whole thing. But you live and you learn, right? After I cleaned up the cuts a bit, I went ahead and used 3M Professional Rubberized Undercoating. Admittedly, I went a little overboard on the mask area, but it's better than going underboard, right? Next, we can get to work on our mounting bracket with our tried and true hole drilling process of first center punching our hole locations, followed by center drilling to give us a nice starting point, and then finally drilling to size. In this case, we are using a 17 30 seconds drill bit with a half inch shank. That last part is important since that's the max size our drill can take. Next, we deburr those drilled holes with our handy deburring tool and follow it up with rust prevention. For rivnuts, nuts, we like using anti-seize to seal those naked metal edges rather than paint which can scratch off with rivnut nut insertion. I'm temporarily skipping this last one because there's actually a wall in here. I didn't know, but there's like a little U-shaped piece like this in here. So I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do with that. 
For rivnet setting, we use the Astro Pneumatics PRM1. It sets these M10 rivnets at 90 PSI, no problem. We have also found that all rivnets are not created equal and our testing anti-twist ones from McMaster are far superior. To deal with this last rivnet issue, I went to work with the Dremel, carving away the wall like a butcher with a butter knife. If you remember how rivnets work from our previous videos and this handy animation from it, what I'm trying to do is give space for that bulge on the backside. So there's probably like a 30% chance this is going to work, but we're going to go with it. Let's see if we can get this rib nut to collapse. Hold it as tight as I can. Woohoo! With that rib nut set, the last precaution I always take is spraying around the area with some fluid film just in case there's any metal chips that I didn't get cleaned out. With the rib nuts installed, I can install these mounting plates on either side with grade 8 flange automotive bolts. Since our design is up between the ribs, I need an exact measurement of how long the cross braces need to be to span between them. 806. 806. Wow. A little bit more square than I thought it would be. In order to ensure that bracket span tubing was perfectly square and cut to that 806 millimeters exactly, I first saw cut and then faced up each of them on the manual mill. All right, here is the bracket underneath. I just got those cut to length. They fit great. Now it's time to weld it up. And now I'm getting tiggy with it. Na 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 na. A little throwback to Big Willie style 1997. Anyways, I'm welding with 5356 rod here and the parts are 6061. I am using the original stainless steel brackets that came with the ISO temp heater to mount it under the van with our custom brackets here. I needed to run some cross holes through the aluminum pieces, so I used the drill press to center drill the location and then finished it off with a cordless drill to size. I did have to make one change to the isotemp brackets as they are normally mounted parallel to the surface and my bracket design calls for perpendicular, if you catch my binicular. I used a bench vise to flatten them out a bit and then drilled a new hole. Modified like this, they fit up between those two spans of our tubing and are mounted with bolts, washers, and nylock nuts. This, my friends, is the face of a proud man. A quick hit with some self-etching primer that's really important with aluminum we found out the hard way and some matte black paint to finish her off and this is ready to mount back under the van. With the bracket mounted in place, I started to snake the 20 liter ISO temp into place. According to the heater manual, if mounted horizontally like this, the discharge or wastewater pipe must be mounted pointing down, which is why I'm rotating it into place here. Then using my patented rest kneesy support method, complete with my hashtag croc life in croc needles on, I held up the water heater against the brackets while inserting the screws through the bands. I then tightened everything up until it was snug and not pictured here, I later put another nylock nut on the end of each bolt for good measure. A quick PSA for y'all, read the manual. There's some great information in there about these heaters. Anyways, we distilled down some of the important stuff for mounting the D5E. And for us, we are gonna go with this particular configuration for mounting in our van. We are looking at the driver's side footwell. I was gonna put it right here with the pump on the side and I'm really sad about this, but it doesn't fit. So I'm gonna have to mount the pump somewhere else because I still want to go right here. This is a nice little cavity for it. After I removed the troublesome pump bracket, I marked the bottom of the actual D5 mounting bracket with the pump attached and then removed that bracket, realigning up those marks in order to mark the holes for drilling. There's actually quite a bit of space behind the footwell for installing rib nuts. I would drill my pilot holes through from under the van and then finish from this side to size. As always, we deburr the holes and then generously apply some of our rust prevention anti-seize. We set our first M6 rib nut and then mounted the bracket back up to make sure our other marked holes were still Gucci. Our right angle DeWalt came in super handy for this project and one of the cool things we've been using a lot lately are these drill stops since drilling through sheet metal can tend to be quite grabby. For the top two locations, our rib nut setter didn't fit and we had to use our homegrown DIY solution. If you're interested in learning more about this, let us know in the comments. With all the rib nuts set and the bracket mounted, we checked the D5 fitment and gave it the old two thumbs up. 
It gets dark a lot earlier these days and way colder. Luckily, we have the overhead lights to keep the van illuminated. I had to wait for this part to show up from Amazon today. I know, uh, so inconvenient that I can order anything online and it shows up in a day or two. Anyways, this is Gates part 28475. This is a molded right angle hose. This is gonna connect from the S-Bar heater directly down into the coolant pump right next to it. Let's go ahead and get this installed. With the Gates 90 degree hose dry fit to the pump, I could get an idea for where to mount it and used a Sharpie to mark the bottom hole. And then I'm starting to sound like a broken record. We first center punch, then we pilot drill, and then of course we open it up to size. So the only reason why I'm not using a chamfer bit here is, well, I don't have one this size big enough. That is my bad. So I'm just using the deburring tool instead. We again used our anti-seize for rust prevention, and because our pneumatic rivnut setter doesn't fit up between the frame members here, we also used our DIY setting solution. The only thing I don't really like about it, the pneumatic does a way better job of like making this surface flush on the front here, but it's all good. You do what you can do. All right, let me go get a bolt. We'll mount this in place, make sure everything's still good, and then drill that other hole there. We are using M6 riv nuts and hardware for all these bracket connections. I hope this looks as awkward as it feels. I feel every time I'm under the van, I'm just I'm not that flexible. So I'm just contorting in weird ways that my body is not meant to contort in. I like that. This will run nice towards the front of the van there. So let's go ahead this you can see that we're actually spaced out here pretty far we're gonna have to make a little spacer or something that goes behind there to give us a nice surface to clamp on Put that position there and while i got this mounted i'm gonna go ahead and mark the hose here as well too this is made by the company gates really like their slogan here driven by possibility it's really Really get me in the mood under here late at night freezing my ass off if you're going to be doing a hydraulic install yourself you'll want to get a set of nice tubing cutters we really like these performance tool cutters for rubber tubing which makes quick work of the task and is so effortless you'd think you are cutting through air for the entirety of this project we are using gates power grip hose clamps which are heat shrink clamps I think they look much cleaner than the traditional hose clamp and supposedly they perform a lot better too. With the pump mounted to the S-Bar D5, everything can go back in for a test fit. My head is pretty much directly in the shot, but rest assured the 90 degree hose works perfectly. Since I have the footwell open to mount the D5, I thought I'd take the opportunity to sound deaden and insulate behind it here. I'm using Silas 3-in-1 Hybrid, and I actually filled this tube with Thinsulate, which is probably totally unnecessary, and then working to fill the rest of the dead space with Thinsulate panels. And here's the finished product. I took the black fabric off the lower piece because the underside of the footwell has this honeycomb void structure, and my thought process is the white insulation will bat up in those cavities a bit. Probably not though, but it's the thought that counts, right? So you can obviously buy these tanks pre-made from places like Rickson's and Heatso, but I couldn't find the one that fit perfectly in the place where I wanted to put it, so I custom designed it in 0.1 inch thick 5052 aluminium. This is the first time I've ever welded this type of thing before, so I didn't really know what to expect, but overall I'm happy with how it came out. I used 4043 aluminum rod to stitch everything together, and the tank is made from three individual bent sheet metal pieces. I got a little bit rowdy in a few places and learned how important it is to feather the pedal at the end of every bead to avoid pinholes in aluminum. However, my biggest issue was I found a leak in my TIG hose that would cause inconsistent argon coverage depending on the torch angle. That was a really fun one to troubleshoot. Not. After I figured that out, things went a lot smoother. Even though I'm planning on running the system unpressurized, I did a pressure test to find a few pinhole leaks by using soapy water brushed along the welds. I re-welded those defects until every seam passed this test. 
Once the tank was fully sealed, I wanted it to blend in when mounted inside the engine bay, so I decided to paint it. So first I laid down a couple base coats of self-etching primer and then finished everything off with a nice matte black paint. Now before we get lost in the jungle of coolant hoses here, there's about to be a lot of stuff happening so I thought I'd flash up the plan to ground the overall objective, but remember, the devil's in the details, so stay tuned for how this all unfolds. Let's open this up and take a look at what we got going on here. That's pretty easy with the Moonraker strut kit. Shout out to that. We're gonna go ahead and mount our custom overflow tank that we designed down in this cavity here. You can see I've added an M6 riv nut here, as well as one right here. And then the bracket also uses this factory grounding stud, which is probably okay as well. This wire normally mounts with plastic clips on two studs in the side of the body here. I went ahead and made two Delrin standoffs. That was so that I could position the tank and get the measurements from where my brackets needed to be. But I'm gonna go ahead and leave them in there because I kind of like them for the extra support. You can actually slide the tank that we made in down through here, it's designed to do that. But I'm gonna go ahead and remove this so that we can see it a little bit better in the video. So let's get that done and move on to the next step. All right, that intake snorkel is out of the way and I wanted to give a quick look down in this space before I put the tank on. You can see I've got this flat plate heat exchanger. This is from Duda Diesel. And I've made a bracket, I machined a bracket that mounts to four factory holes. They were already through holes there. The screws just come in from the bottom. You can see this is quite rigid. I've got these three angled connectors and one straight connector. The straight connector, that's gonna be fed down from the tank. Fluid gets pulled this way out of this angled connector. And then that goes down to the hydronic heater below the van. These two are going to be spliced into the engine loop. So it will come from the engine in here and then out back to that same splice. And that's how we're gonna steal engine heat to heat the hot water when we're not running the D5E. Anyways, let's get the tank mounted here and everything set up. As mentioned before, the tank gets mounted via three locations, two rivnuts nuts I added and the factory grounding bolt. I don't have any plans to use this particular ground location, so I figured it'd be okay and wanted to add some extra stability. The hose from Napa Auto worked great and those guys in San Rafael let me go in the back and dig through what they had to find the right one, which is awesome. While I was in here, I heat shrinked the lower hose clamp in place. All right, the tank's mounted in here and that lower coolant hose that I was worried about is all mounted in. You can see it's nice. We got the level kind of gauge here on the side. And then I went ahead and put some of this high temperature silicone foam on the back just to add a thermal break between these wires and the tank. Here's a quick look at the overflow routing. It goes down along the side of the tank and then the molded coolant hose where it tucks under the heat exchanger and through a factory hole that I lined with a grommet from the grommet kit I've been using and then under the van. Under the van, I used one of the edge clip zip ties we've been using to attach the hose to the plastic liner and mimic the look of the other factory hose. Back to the hydronic loop hoses. Here's what I have so far. I started the flow and return lines. I'm gonna make a bracket that mounts into the engine cover here for a nice finished factory look. And right now those hoses follow the main radiator hose over to the other side of the engine bay. The hoses are behind the windshield washer fluid tank, but I'm going to route them down and in front of it shortly. I saw a similar hose route to this on Sprinter Source behind the fender liners. And once I pulled them off to inspect, I realized it would be an awesome solution for my setup. In order to keep the hose fixed in the correct place along this wall, I machined some clamshell brackets and attached them to the van with M6 riv nuts and bolts. Here's where I ended up with the hoses behind the fender lines. I picked up this high heat and high abrasion resistance sleeving and covered the hoses all the way up to the top of the engine bay past the windshield washer fluid tank. You can see I also lined any sharp metal edges with trim lock edge protector. I don't see these hoses moving much, but I did want to protect them from any chafing to the hose or the paint for that matter. I did put one zip tie up through this hole to hold it tight against this frame feature, and then put some other zip ties around the sleeving just to fully secure it in place. You'll also notice, or maybe you didn't, but I rotated the zip tie heads around for a nice clean and finished look. 
Here's that upper hose bracket we just finished on the CNC made from nylon. I would probably just surface the whole top section next time because you can see the transition from the facing operation here. But it turned out pretty nice and should hold our hoses nice and secure to those clips on the top of the engine cover. I have no idea what they are for, but they're unused on my van, so we're going to take advantage of that. I was doing some testing before, and this shape seemed to work pretty well in those holes, so we have these two metal studs we machined as well. I was legit shocked and a little giddy at how well this bracket clicked into place and how sturdy it feels overall. I shouldn't be with so much pre-planning that took place, but I've had other projects planned and they still failed and there's no certainty but death and taxes in this life, am I right? Anyways, I guess my point is it's these small wins and delights that I have learned to cherish along this journey. So I got this cable clip here, I bent the ends to kind of match the angle of that where that one is hooked down there. And then this is going to go like this and hold one of these and then we'll zip tie the two together. To connect our engine loop to the flat plate heat exchanger, this hose going to the van's heater core is the one we chose to splice. We used the track saw clamps to pinch the hose to avoid as much coolant loss as possible and then made sure we cut the hose in a place that still allowed one side of it to use the factory clip. We then installed two gates, 28625 90 degree elbows to divert the coolant loop to the heat exchanger. All right, we just finished leak testing. We also fired up the engine to see how the heat was running. It's working great. This thing down here is heating up so well. This heater core line right here is the one that we cut. You can see we put in two elbows. I made sure to cut this one low enough that I could still use that clip. This one coming up from the engine goes in to our heat exchanger here, which then goes through the flat plate heat exchanger and then goes back up here and then up into the actual heater core. I did wrap this one right here because it does kind of rub on the fittings in between here. And then this is the hydronic portion. So it comes down from the tank there, goes into the flat plate heat exchanger, goes up, flows over here, across the top, down on that side of the van, and then this is the return line. My system, the way I designed it, requires another auxiliary pump to be mounted in line with the one that came from S-Bar. I went with this one from Bosch. We need this so that we can turn on the loop without controlling the D5 while driving to pull free heat from the engine. I had the hardest time finding an off-the-shelf bracket that made sense, so I made another custom bracket that slips over the pump and uses clamping force to hold it in place. Wouldn't you know, in order to mount that custom bracket, I'd have to make a custom stub drill bit? Well, <laughs> so I fired up the old farm engineering skills I picked up from living in Idaho for a bit. What's farm engineering? Well, when the tractor supply is already closed for the night and you gotta get back to work at the butt crack of dawn, you make it happen any means necessary. So that stubby drill I made here worked no problem. But of course I cut the only drill bit that I have that is dull. <laughs> so it took a little bit. I think I would just buy a stub drill bit instead of doing all that work. And well, what do you know, I had to make another custom bracket for the drain fitting. They just don't make any good solutions for this type of stuff. Anyways, let's get this mounted in the van. There is a lot going on here, but our two hoses from behind the fender liner come down from the front of the van. The first hose drops down into our auxiliary pump with the custom mounting bracket, which then goes into the S-bar pump that feeds the import on the D5 heater. And the other return line goes into our drain again with another custom bracket. This hose and the out hose from the D5 heater continue back through these pipes, which is another Sprinter OEM part number we purchased that really does a great job routing around the gas tank and the frame members here, and then goes up and terminates at our water heater, completing the full hydronic loop. For the exhaust, I ordered an Evisbacher elbow piece to keep the run low profile, and really my only legit option was to thread the needle over the coolant hoses. I'm mirroring the exhaust run exactly how we did it for our D2 air heater on the passenger side. 
I got a few cues on the D2 heater about how I cut the exhaust hose, so I took a shot here where I slice through most of it with a hacksaw and then finish it off with the tin snips. I wrapped the tail of the exhaust around the support member, clearing the pinch weld and pointed slightly towards the rear of the vehicle. I will say drilling these holes and mounting this thing is way easier without the mud flap and the fender liners on. Here's a quick look at the finished exhaust. I used two heat shield products lava tubes over the coolant hoses to protect them and then continued on to the muffler and outlet tucked behind the mud flap here. Let's have a little chat about our intake solution here really quick as I've never seen anything like this on any other DIY build. I took an old factory Sprinter D5 intake part number, chopped it down and added a Wobasto silencer in the middle to help with the intake noise. The beauty of this solution is that it pulls air from the frame member just like our D2 heater, but it fully seals in that frame member hole, which is awesome. I used two stepless clamps on the silencer and then a traditional hose clamp that came with my kit to attach it to the heater. Here's the wiring diagram for the harness that most closely matches the one I bought. I picked this heater up from Tech Van Life in Canada, so this is the North American harness. The SPAR diagrams can be pretty confusing, so take your time to understand the parts and reach out if you have any questions. All right, this SPAR cable was way too long. This is the one that goes to the coolant pump, so I'm shortening it up. I had to take that purple part out and it kind of slides out of this, you can see there and then you take a flathead screwdriver and you press on the pins right here with this purple piece gone and that will allow you to slide the cables out. And then I have these pieces left over from the SPAR D2 install. These are the little kind of rubber gaskets and then these pins, I had some extra left over um, and they're the exact same pins, which is awesome. So I'll go ahead and link all these part numbers in the description below. There are three main connectors on the SPAR here. This first one is for the power, 12 volt DC to the heater. This second one is for the S-Bar coolant pump. I have this split loom in a split loom, split loom section, if you will. And then it splits out here and goes up alongside the D5 with a little P-clip attached, and then goes over and back to the pump where it plugs in on the side. I also have our auxiliary pump following that same route back where it splits off and goes into the cab under the driver's seat. And finally, the last plug on the S-Bar is all the communication and additional control. Those green wires right there control the fuel pump, which is also split loom back into the mother split loom where it makes its way to its associated connector. This is what pulls diesel from our fuel tank into the D5. Some of the other cables that come from this last plug and make their way around the same route are first the CAN bus control cable labeled as lowercase c in the diagram. This is eventually going to be plugged into our Easy Start Pro controller of which you can run a D2 and a D5 on the same one. I'm just waiting for the required harness which I will cover in a later video. Next is the diagnostic cable that we will just leave terminated as is under the van since our Easy Start Pro will handle that. Then we have a fuse holder and a fuse that will suffer the same fate left under the van. And then we have our last communication wire labeled as C1 in the diagram that follows the first cable we mentioned at the heater power and our auxiliary pump wiring into this rubber boot that will pop out under the driver's seat. This is the same rubber boot we used for the D2 install video as well. Here is everything Russian nesting split loom together. The amount of split loom in this cavity has us splitting hairs. I'm going to wait to test it tape the upper portion until I get that CAN bus cable connection to the easy start settled. Now this is not wiring related, but because I have an S-Bar D5 and a D2 now, I swapped out the single Dorman connection to a Dorman T connection to the fuel tank. The one pump for the D2 remained in the exact same spot, and now we have the new D5 pump mounted in this location with an M6 rivnut and at the appropriate angle, of course. The hose makes a nice fluid loop, gets bundled into the mother split loom, and then makes its way down to the heater port like so. Our two other cables, the main power cable and the C1 cable from the diagram, come up through the boot under the driver's seat and run with our D2 wires. You can see we also labeled them and they follow each other out from underneath the seat and then up the B pillar. Here's a look at those two cable ends. Obviously the big boy is the main power and should be connected to 12 volt DC and fused or breakered at 20 amps. 
And this smaller connector is that C1 cable, which is the easy start signal. You can actually short the yellow wire from this cable to the red one or positive 12 volt DC, and it will actually turn the heater on and off. And you can simply run it this way, either on a switch or a timer. I may actually hook this up to the Serbo GX long-term to have it kick on automatically at a certain temperature point, but that will be TBD once the other harness comes for the Easy Start Pro. So you'll wanna stay tuned for how all that comes together. We did one last thing here, and that's wire in our auxiliary pump. We grounded it to the stud in the seat box and then ran the positive wire from the Ignition D+. This is the same one we used for our audio amp, and this is only powered when the van is running. I also added a little fuse here because I'm a responsible guy, and this wire runs down through the battery box and up behind the dash to our little custom button here. So basically how this works is when the van is running, we can toggle this cute little button on or off. If it's on, it fires up the auxiliary pump in our hydronic heating loop and pulls heat from the engine through that heat plate exchanger. This allows us to heat the hot water tank without actually having to turn the S-bar on and technically for free, even though we know nothing in this life is truly free, while we are driving from place to place. Pretty sweet, huh? Now I'm not gonna fill this up quite yet. We have a few more things in store for this hydronic system in our van, so you wanna stay tuned for that. But I'm gonna talk about what I plan on using. This is CrowdTech 100 by the company Hercules. It's a propylene glycol, which means it's a non-toxic glycol, and it's specifically formulated for use in hydronic systems like the one in our van. Well, well, my friends, that wraps up another video in the Adventure Van Build Series. We are really pleased with how everything came together, and we now have a HIST system that can heat our hot water in three distinct redundant ways. First, pulling engine heat from the van itself. Second, through shore power, hooked up to the 110 element in the water heater. And then finally, the D5. If you're gonna follow in our footsteps, it's definitely intermediate to professional level. I guess that's why these companies like Rickson's and Aqua Hot exist, because if you you buy a solution from them off the shelf it definitely lowers that barrier to entry but you are going to spend a lot more in total we spent about twenty four hundred dollars to put this kit together that includes the tank the d5 as well as all the extra accessories that you've seen here we did already have the easy start pro from the d2 install so that saved us a couple hundred benjamins the total time i kind of lost track it was through the holidays and work gets a little bit crazy at the end of the year but if i sat down and did this project it would probably be about 16 to 20 hours start to finish. If you like what we are doing, please go ahead and give us a thumbs up. It really does help us out. If you have any questions or comments about anything you've seen in this video, drop those in the comments section below. I personally respond to each and every one. And on your way down there, you know what to do. Slap that subscribe button. We'll see you next time. in the devil's lettuce out there. Anyways, we're gonna be <laughs> this member for the cylindrical uh, 